We at Edmund Scientific are privileged to be working with Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Before introducing you to Dr. Hynek, I want to tell you something about him. Dr. Hynek is director of the Center for UFO Studies at Evanston, Illinois. He is also professor of astronomy at Northwestern University. For more than 20 years, Dr. Hynek has served as astronomical consultant to the United States Air Force for their sign and blue book projects used for studying and processing UFO sightings reported to Air Force bases. I would also like to point out that the results of the center's investigations are published monthly in the International UFO Reporter and can be obtained by writing to the center at Evanston, Illinois. Doctor, it's nice to see you. I'm happy to discuss one of my favorite subjects. Over the years, my colleagues and I have received a steady flow of requests for facts related to the UFO phenomenon. In an effort to answer these requests, I have assembled for Edmund Scientific the following current informative material to help answer those questions most often asked. Now, Doctor, I would like to open with what you might consider a basic question. Has anyone ever disproved that the UFO phenomenon exists? How could one disprove the obvious fact that UFO reports exist and continue to be made by responsible people and from all over the world? I do not mean here the reports which turn out to be bright planets, aircraft, meteors, and a host of things in the sky which puzzle some untutored people. Simply, the U in UFO means unidentified. But unidentified not only to the person reporting, but also to those highly experienced persons who study the reports. If they can't find a reasonable explanation, then and only then are we dealing with a UFO. Such reports do exist, and they constitute the UFO phenomenon. And they have been made from all over the world, as our first slide illustrates. This map was prepared by Dr. Jacques Vallée. Notice that UFO reports are truly global and that they seem to occur in waves or flaps as they are often called. We have noted here the years that UFO flaps have occurred in various countries. The United States had its last wave in 1973, but notice how the flaps have been distributed throughout the years and over the world. How many reports are there, Doctor? This will come as a surprise to you. Very few people are aware of the enormous scope of the UFO phenomenon. At the center, we keep a computerized data bank of reports. You'll notice that I say reports, not UFO cases. Only careful investigation can establish the validity of any given report. At present, we have in our catalog over 56,000 individual reports cataloged. The UFO catalog is called UFOCAT for short. People are just not aware of how many reports exist. As reports come to the attention of the center, they are coded into UFOCAT. And then, if one wishes to know how many reports came from a certain country or a state in any given month or year, we just ask the computer to print it out for us. Many of the slides you will see now were made from just such printouts. This slide shows the distribution by year of 56,490 UFO reports contained in UFOCAT as of 1977. Notice the peak years of 1954, 1967, and 1973. The last three years show a question mark because there is a several years lag before a reasonably complete roundup of worldwide UFO reports can be made. Thus, the small number for 1976 is probably quite misleading. Now, a very important point. Obviously, not all the massive reports coming to our attention can be checked, especially those from other countries. UFOCAT, therefore, contains a great many IFOs, identifiable flying objects. The source of each entry is coded into UFOCAT, as is the type of report. Close encounters are separated from nocturnal light reports, for instance. If, therefore, we limit our printout to what we call the high strangeness cases, the close encounters, we greatly reduce the probable number of cases that can be ascribed to Venus, aircraft at a distance, and the like. Not eliminate them, just reduce them. The red portion of each column on this slide represents only the high strangeness cases in UFOCAT. Oddly enough, they follow roughly the same distribution as do the reports in general. This could mean that in the years when many close encounters are reported, many people are also encouraged to report misidentifications. Of course, I do not mean to imply that all close encounters are necessarily real UFOs. These cases, too, contain many IFOs. As most of you know, the Air Force Project Blue Book ended in 1969. All Blue Book reports have also been coded into UFOCAT. 
This slide shows the proportion of Blue Book cases contained in UFOCAT and, of course, the distribution of Blue Book reports over the years. The Air Force files contain mostly IFOs and low strangeness cases. The Air Force chronicled only 600 unidentified reports out of a total of some 13,000. As we shall shortly see, UFOCAT contains three times as many close encounters as do the Blue Book files. This is in itself a sad commentary on the inadequacy of the Air Force project. The steady decrease in the number of cases in the closing years of Blue Book may indicate that people were reluctant to report to the Air Force. Reports to various civilian organizations in this and other countries went on apace. Now, in all of, the, of this discussion, it must be remembered that all we can deal with are UFO reports that have been made and have come to the attention of the Center for UFO Studies. The number of reports tells us only a little about the total number of UFO sightings. That depends on the ease with which reports can be made and on whether the witnesses make a report in the first place. Our evidence is extremely strong that even in this country, for every report made, there are probably more than a dozen sightings that go unreported. And the higher the strangeness of the sighting, the less chance of its being reported for increased fear of ridicule. Here we have by themselves the distribution by year of all the Blue Book reports as released through the National Archives. Note that the peaks for the years 1952, 57, and 66 are virtually identical, and thus somewhat at a variance with the previous slide. This slide is based, however, on the actual number of reports now available in the archives microfilms of the Blue Book files. Across the years, apparently, some of the original Blue Book cases were lost or misplaced. Here we have the distribution of UFO reports among the various regions and areas of the world. To take this slide at face value would be very misleading. North America very probably may not have more UFO reports than do other countries. We may just hear about them more readily. Then there are language difficulties and even perhaps restrictions on reporting in some countries. Naturally, UFO reports in our own country interest us the most. Here we see the distribution of all UFO cases in UFOCAT by state. Here again, we must be careful to note the importance of population and ease of reporting. Perhaps Montana has as many UFO events as New York State, but there aren't as many people around to see them. Likewise, it may not be as easy to make a UFO report in some states and the desire to make a report may itself vary in different parts of the country. Once again, I must remind you that UFOCAT contains a great many reports which are reports of misidentified ordinary objects, despite efforts to weed these out. Naturally, areas of high population will have more such reports. But we have found that when we confine ourselves to UFO reports of very high strangeness, like close encounters of the third kind, there seems to be a negative correlation with population in the immediate area of the sighting. What do we mean by close encounters of the third kind? This and the classification system for UFO reports used here is explained in the next slide. We have taken a look at UFO reports in general. Let's now look more closely at some specifics of the UFO phenomenon itself. What kinds of reports are made and by what sorts of people? This slide will help. The system of classification is based on the manner in which the UFO was observed and implies nothing about the UFO or its origin. If the UFO is perceived as a strange light in the night sky, we call it a nocturnal light. If it is seen in the daytime, it is called a daylight disk, simply because the majority of daylight sightings are of oval-shaped objects. If it is detected primarily by radar, and especially if the radar observation confirms a visual observation, we call it a radar visual case, or it can simply be called a radar case. If the sighting occurs quite close to the observer, we call it a close encounter. If it is merely close, we call it a close encounter of the first kind. If the UFO reportedly leaves some physical sign of its presence, like burned marks on the ground, it is called a close encounter of the second kind. And finally, if some sort of creatures or entities are reported in association with the sighted object, we call it a close encounter of the third kind. These certainly have a high strangeness rating. And this matter of strangeness is explained in the next slide. Strangeness, as applied to UFO reports, simply means how unusual the report seems. How much does it conflict with our common sense? Thus, generally, nocturnal lights have a low strangeness. But a report of a luminous craft landing nearby from which beings emerge, well, that's a report of high strangeness. Now we plot strangeness against the probability that the given account is true as reported. 
as shown in this slide. The latter, that is the probability, clearly depends on the credibility of the witnesses. The greater the reputation and credibility of the witnesses, the higher the probability that the report can be taken at face value. Those reports that fall in the upper right-hand part of this diagram demand the most careful attention. This particular diagram is taken from my book, The UFO Experience. Here we see how relatively few high strangeness cases there are among UFO reports in general. Many of the low strangeness cases must be ascribed to misidentifications. It is much harder to so explain the high strangeness cases, most of which are close encounters. Specifically, this slide compares UFOCAT minus Blue Book cases to Blue Book cases alone. With the Air Force's avowed philosophy that there simply were no UFOs, very few high strangeness cases were passed along military wires to Blue Book offices at Dayton, Ohio. At any rate, only one-tenth of one percent of the Blue Book cases were close encounters of the third kind, that is, with occupants reported. Whereas in the UFOCAT minus Blue Book, four percent of all cases were CE3s, as we call close encounters of the third kind, 40 times as many. This slide indicates an interesting trend. On the basis of available data, it would appear that the percentage of high strangeness cases is increasing with the years. Does this mean that there actually are more such cases being reported, or that people don't report the less spectacular cases as perhaps the public grows more sophisticated about UFOs and IFOs? It is certainly true that the UFO literature today tends to avoid publishing lights in the night sky type of reports, whereas in earlier years they did. And the circulation of reports itself may indeed be more selective today. Likewise, some people may also be more willing to report stranger cases, fearing ridicule somewhat less than in the past. In any event, more study is needed before this diagram can be accepted at face value. Any statistical results, no matter in what field of study, are usually open to several interpretations. So far, we've said little about the persons who report UFOs, except to point out that many persons who have had UFO experiences are reluctant to report them. The more so, the more sensitive their position in the community. First of all, are witnesses to UFOs generally single witnesses, that is, lone witnesses? This slide shows that for about 24,000 cases for which these data were available, only 37% were single witnesses. 63% of the cases had two or more witnesses. This is significant from several standpoints. First, if virtually all UFO reports came from solitary witnesses, one would surely be justified in thinking that there was some aberration about the person involved. But when several witnesses, sometimes not in communication with each other, report essentially the same details, it really becomes harder to resort to, say, a hallucination theory. Secondly, it has been demonstrated that the majority of the truly puzzling reports come from well-educated, technically trained, often professional people. There's no question about it. Very few UFO reports are made by crackpots and mental incompetence. <coughs> Carrying this study further, this slide shows what happens when we ask whether single or multiple witnesses report more cases of high strangeness. We see that there are no striking differences, but there is a trend. As we proceed from single witnesses to dual and then multiple witnesses, the three sections of the pie, respectively, the number of low strangeness cases rises slightly but systematically, and, of course, the percentage of high strangeness cases goes down. However, it is significant that a quarter of the multiple witness cases are of high strangeness. When three or more witnesses are involved in a close encounter case, their testimony cannot so easily be dismissed. We emphasize the high strangeness cases in UFOCAD because it appears that these cases, mostly close encounters, would not so likely be misidentifications of Venus, of meteors, of distant aircraft, or balloons than would be true of low strangeness cases. This is conjecture at the moment, but further research as this becomes possible, I feel will establish this beyond reasonable doubt. Do more men or more women report UFOs? And what is their respective age distribution? At the moment, we have this complete information for only 541 cases. But this slide shows that men outnumber women as UFO reporters and that younger people predominate. If we consider sex alone and not age, we then have far more data. But it still shows that men outnumber women in the reporting of UFO cases by more than three to one. This does not mean, of course, that men see more UFOs than women, only that they report more. More study is needed and a breakdown into types of UFOs as well as IFOs is needed.
Now let us look at how UFO sightings are related to time. How long does an average UFO sighting last? Is there a preferred time of day or time of year for UFO sightings? In this slide, we look first at how long sightings last. We separate sightings of low strangeness and high strangeness and plot for each group the durations of these sightings. Is there any significant difference? We see that there is. There are a large number of low strangeness sightings of under a minute duration. Probably this is due to a large number of short duration lights in the night sky, like meteors, for instance. But when we come to the high strangeness cases, we find the majority in the 5 to the 14 minute duration class. This is important because it shows that in such cases, the witnesses did have ample time to observe and examine. What about the time of day? Is there a preferred time? In this slide, we see that indeed there is. The graph is deliberately limited to close encounters of the second and third kinds. Those of the second kind are further divided into the so-called EM or electromagnetic cases, those in which electrical systems are reportedly interfered with, and into the physical trace cases, those in which tangible marks have been left by the UFO. While in general, all three types show a slow rise in the afternoon hours, rising to a maximum a few hours before midnight, and a decrease toward dawn, which continues to noon, the close encounters of the third kind show a definite second maximum between 2 and 4 a.m. This gives rise to the very interesting speculation that if there were as many people out of doors at 3 a.m. as there are at 9 or 10 p.m., might we not have a tremendous number of humanoid sightings, more than any other kinds of close encounters? If we include all reports in the catalog for which we have data, or 27,559 cases, we still find the maximum occurring between 8 and 10 in the evening.